just so I don't forget, there will be question and answer time straight after the talk. And a thought that I had was, especially as you're studying the letter to James, or letter of, of James in your life groups during the week, or just personally, um, why don't you write down your questions and bring them to the Q&A time, because it can, I think, be sometimes more fruitful if you've got uh, things that you've been thinking through and you bring them, rather than uh, maybe just off-the-cuff stuff that uh, is popping out of the talk. So it's just an encouragement think, to you to think a little bit more longer range and bring those questions with you to church. That would be a good thing to do. The Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Abuse. And we don't need to go beyond the title of that to understand what happened. Um, children were abused in institutions, and that was bad enough, but even worse was the institutional response. And that was so bad that there needed to be a royal commission. And amongst those institutions, there, many of them were Christian churches. And what happened was that they said one thing, and they did another completely evil thing. And though saying that they believed in a God who cared, um, they failed to care for those people in their care. And in many cases, they were caring for orphans, a category of people actually addressed in James's letter today. Now, the Royal Commission investigated systemic failures, and, and often it's so easy just to say, oh, yes, them, those bad people there. And, but what James is speaking to is our personal fails. We know God's way of love, and yet we find it much easier to be unkind and selfish. And instead of true religion, what we're responsible for is, is bad religion. And in James's language, it's immature. <clears throat> it's not grown-up Christianity. Um, it's anything but. And the question that I wanted to look at tonight, which I is the question that James raises in this passage is, how can a person live in a way that actually pleases God and blesses others? That is, how can we actually be mature? And in the words of James, how can we produce the righteousness God desires? And I'm taking that language out of verse 20. So I'm seeing verse 20 as my key, really, because this is the assertion that James makes there. Not only does God desire righteousness but with his help, it's actually possible. <laughs> and that's what he's talking about. I think it's important to note just here before we get going too far, sometimes when you read James, you can feel like he has got a piece, a, a fence paling and he is absolutely hammering you between the eyes the whole time. And I think if you come away from James thinking that, you, you haven't really understood. And this is what I mean. What James is actually saying is that here is God's goal Here's the challenge, but here are God's resources, actually, to be achieving what God wants for his saved people. Because with his help, it is actually possible. And it, tonight what we're going to see is it's a matter of listening to the word, it's a matter of humbly accepting the word, and then with his help, it's doing the word of grace in Christ. So let's ask for his help now by his spirit, that we'd understand these things and we'd actually practice them as soon as we finish our time together tonight. Please join me, let's pray. Father, you've shown us mercy in Christ Jesus so that we might live to bring you glory in everything that we do. Please help us listen now to your word, humbly accept your word and empower us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit to do what you say in Jesus' name. Amen. So the word is a really key concept in James. So what is it? <clears throat> well, in chapter 1, verse 18, we hear this. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So James was Jesus' brother and he was also a disciple of Jesus. So you can read about the word that James heard in the four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, because James was there. But we've also dipped into hearing about the word and what James understood of it in Acts. That was why we read Acts chapter 15 tonight. And James says that God purifies hearts by giving the Holy Spirit to all 
through the grace of the Lord Jesus. That's how people are saved. Now, that's in the context of people hammering them that these new converts should actually observe the Jewish law. And James says, no, let, let me tell you what the big rocks are. It's grace that God gives to all, no matter, of, no matter ethnicity, and then there are these things to avoid. Food sacrifice to idols, sex that doesn't match up with God's plan for it, strangled meat and blood. Make sure you're trusting Jesus and you're avoiding these things. That's what James says. And then when we get to the letter to James, we, we understand a little bit more of this word that he's talking about. Have a look in chapter 1, verse 1. And you'll see there that James says, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a massive thing to say. There's so much to unpack. But put, put simply, it means this, that Jesus of Nazareth is God's ruler and saving Messiah. And then he says in verse 3 and verse 6, he refers to faith. So trust. And then he says, and like I said before, in verse 18, he says, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ have new life and are just the first bits of a bumper harvest that's going to come into eternity. So we can flourish, actually, in connection with him, not die. So how do God's people produce God's righteousness? Well, trust and live out the life-giving word about Jesus Christ. And he sets out a really clear practical progression. Listen to the word. Humbly accept the word. Do the word. So first of all, let's, let's consider listening to the word. So have a glance down or a glance up at the screen, whichever, if the words are going to come up. Verses 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters. So he's got affection for these people. He loves these people. He's writing actually for the good of these people. And he says, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce God-likeness. It just does not produce God's righteousness. So I reckon this is good advice any time, right? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. It's going to help you consider. It's going to help you reflect. It's going to help you calm down and hopefully be a better contributor to whatever circumstance you find yourself in. But it's not just kind of general good living advice that James is giving, he's talking about how you would respond to this word of truth that we just heard about in verse 18. What do you do with that word of truth? Well, you listen to it. You don't speak over it. And you respond to the kindness of God that's in it. This is the first step in bearing fruit, being part of those juicy first bits of God's eternal harvest. But... <clears throat> Let me help us understand by just seeing the opposites, okay? So what all I've done simply is reversed verse 19. Be slow to listen to the gospel or don't listen to it at all. Be really quick to make up your own mind, absolutely uninformed by Jesus. Um, be quick to get angry because life's not about grace, it's just all about what you should have, what you deserve, and what other people should do for you. But beware, this produces the opposite of God's character. And in fact, it's worthy of God's condemnation. <laughs> so what does God want? Well, he, he wants righteousness to be formed in us. And how does this happen? He says it's really simple. You just listen to Jesus and don't listen to yourself. So here's the obvious question. Are you listening? So I just did a little bit of a thought exercise of, of perhaps <clears throat> how my, the first two hours of my day could go after waking up. My phone does sit by my bed and it's charging overnight. Pick it up, look at the news, move on to emails, a little bit of music, 
check out what YouTube thinks I should be looking at today, check in with Insta, TikTok, and it's just about time for coffee at 8 o'clock. And before I drink the coffee, I'm agitated because I want to know if the war in Ukraine's over yet. Is the war in Ukraine over yet? Is the war in Ukraine over yet? Well, did Liverpool win? I'm wound up. <laughs> now, as we look back and we think back to what was said in Acts chapter 15, we see that they're saying that life is all about Christ-centeredness. It's all about God's plan for us all in Christ. His grace is the way that God relates to people. The crown of life actually comes as people trust in Jesus. So shouldn't I be organising my day to at least start with being reminded about God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ? And how might I organise other parts of my day to be checking back in with that good news rather than worrying about Tom Brady and whether the Tampa Buccaneers won the NFL? Yeah, I should. So I really love it that Ian has introduced soap to us because I'm personally finding it really, really helpful. Um, in the words of someone else, actually, it's been my same experience that it's just helped me to slow my Bible reading down and think a little bit more deeply. And in particular, what I like is having to write out the prayer, which helps me go back through the passage and actually draw it back down into something that needs to be prayed up. And the extension of doing soap just individually is that we're trying to do this as a community, which is fantastic because when we would see each other, and that's why I've got soap written on my hand, I would ask, have you soaped? And you would ask, have I soaped? <laughs> and what we would be really asking each other is, how has the Lord been leading you and speaking to you about his grace rather than you having your head full of whatever it is that's been fed to you through your social media today? Because that's going to produce God-like character. And that's what God wants. And that comes, actually, at least in the first stage of listening to the word. But James doesn't leave it there. He says, welcome the word. Let's have a look at verse 21. This is chap James chapter 1, verse 21. Therefore, <coughs> because your own judgment is going to produce a train wreck and not the righteousness of God, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So let's just have a look at, at a really obvious contrast for a moment. Only the implanted word has power to save. Okay? That's the thing that will save your souls. The word has the power to give life forever with God, and any alternative is utterly powerless and utterly useless. And yet, um, everything else is usually what we grab for more easily, because that's just what we're like. But that's a really bad thing because the contrast that James sets up is that immoral or dishonourable actions and motives, as the opposite of what God wants, they actually kill the soul. What doesn't conform to God's accepted standards is actually hurtful to us in an eternal way. But he, he, goes, he goes further than that. He says he's talking about wickedness, being morally wrong or evil. That is in direct opposition to God. Now, you might be listening to this and thinking, now, hang on a sec, I'm not Satan, I'm not walking around with a pitchfork, I'm not trying to do the devil's work. But what do you find as you follow Jesus through the Gospels and then those who follow him into the later New Testament is that there is no middle ground. And I wanted us to just see that for a moment by listening to Jesus as he explains the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. And if you'd like to, why don't you turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 13. It's a, it's a super, super key parable because he says at the start, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? And I think what he's actually saying is that this is, this is the key. If you want to understand anything that's coming after this, just keep reflecting on this and it all fits into this grid. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown in rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. 
when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it and produce a crop, some, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. So Jesus is saying really that there are only two soils, there are only two outcomes here. There are those who will hear the word from my mouth and accept it and there's everybody else who for lots of different reasons which seem kind of like good reasons at times won't accept the word. And it's quite striking isn't it because even in that parable we see potentially what the problem is for us. The seed seems so small, it seems so weak, it seems, seems so useless and when we just think these are words from Jesus' mouth is that really powerful? <laughs> Can they actually do anything? But the contrast is so great and the need to listen is so serious that James says, get rid of anything that really is not coming from the mouth of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Realise their powerlessness. Realise Jesus' power and welcome actually, and this is a really key thing, humbly accept the word planted in you. So he's talking to Christians, right? Because the word's implanted. Now, you need to keep accepting it and being humble. And this is how it basically works. He was the opposite again. Proudly reject the word that's been implanted in you. And the dynamic is quite clear, isn't it? Because either you can say, Jesus' word is powerful and it saves me and it helps me understand the kingdom of God and actually it welcomes me in as I repent and I believe in him. You can say that, yeah, Jesus is above me and his word is more powerful and it speaks over my life. Or you can say, my own word and my own opinion informed by any single other narrative that's out there is far more powerful and far more effective and Jesus' word is going to be relegated. And so, Jesus, I, I preside over Jesus' word. And I will proudly reject Jesus' word. There's the dynamic. There's the dynamic. And so James is saying, and I wonder sometimes how he knew me, humbly accept the word of Jesus that's planted in you because it's more powerful than your own word. Listen to Jesus' ideas and not your own. So why, why do we choose what we choose? Um, I heard a really helpful reflection on that this week actually and the person said this it's not that we're really sold out to evil and it's not that we really want to worship satan and kind of really grab onto anything that he's doing it's just that we see what is good in the part of this thing that becomes a choice that's not jesus and we say okay well that's not so bad and then we kind of keep making those choices and making those choices and making those choices. I don't know, maybe a little bit of a tangential example. Uh, just in the last 48 hours, I went up to Sydney and back and there's a, an extended piece of road work where the two lanes are still working, but because of the work that's being done, there's restricted space and the speed limit needs to be lowered. And of course I observed the road work speed limit. But there are many unrighteous people <laughs> who do not. And as they fly past me, I'm tempted to think, hmm, would it really be that bad if I sped up just a bit? I am an excellent driver. And this car is a pretty good car. I had it serviced just recently. I don't think there would be any harm in just speeding up just a little bit and breaking the law. Can you see? Like, it's not, not necessarily a bad thing. I don't feel like I'm worshipping the devil by disobeying the roadwork speed limit. But I'm finding kind of what looks like good, but it, it's, it's, not, it's not the best. And so I choose what's good, but it's not the best. And as James has described, actually, chapter 1, verse 13 to 15, I question God and his motives. I back myself more than I'll listen to him. I'll take one step in the opposite direction, and that will lead me to another step in the opposite direction. And what James says is, as you keep sliding down that path, you end up in hell because you've backed yourself more than you've listened to the Lord Jesus. And so the antidote is actually letting God's word overpower your own word and letting this gospel seed within you actually grow rather than suppressing it or killing it, 
or allowing Satan actually to grab it. So it's listen to the word, humbly accept and welcome the word, but it doesn't stop there. The practical progression to produce God's righteousness concludes in actually doing the word. So have a look, verse one, or chapter 1, verse 22, and then 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And then verse 25. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, that is, the gospel of grace in the Lord Jesus Christ, and continues in it, not forgetting what they heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So those who are hearers and not doers, he says, they're just deceivers. Um, because the believing actually shows in living. And if your showing is not living it out, then it actually reflects on the fact that you're not knowing. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. And here's why it's a massive challenge for people like us. Because you are highly educated. You are highly intelligent. And you have been and you are being raised in a society that says, know this, pass this test. And if you can pass this test, that proves that you know stuff. And that's how it's going to keep going. And if you can keep proving that you know stuff, it's going to go well for you, actually. And so it's really hard for people like us, who are creatures of our environment, to actually press down into the doing because we feel like our knowing is enough. And this is highlighted um, really well recently and some of the staff and others of us who were at the CMS dinner were deeply challenged about this when we heard an Australian brother in Christ speak about what's going on in Dubai, a ministry amongst many, many itinerant workers in Dubai. And he said, look, we have come to a realisation which is in part a rejection of how it works in some of our circles, evangelical churches in Australia, because what we realised was that evangelical churches in Australia work on this principle, that maturity is revelation. So the more you know, the more mature you are in the Christian life. But as we've looked again at Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and Ephesians 4, and other passages about discipleship and Jesus' mission and what it actually means to be Christian, this is the conclusion that we've reached. That Christian maturity is in the experimentation, in the doing, in the living, and he presses it even further and says, Christian maturity shows in multiplication that you would get on with Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and each of us would be involved in that, even to the point where we're baptising the people who become Christians through how we have shared Christ with them. And I think that fits with what James is saying. He's saying this is not just for your ears and mind, but it's for your life. So the question becomes, are you doing and being blessed? Are you living the Christian life? And he has this amazing example, doesn't he, James, at this point. He says, knowing and not doing is like this. Looking into a mirror and immediately walking away and forgetting your face. Who does that? No one. That, that's the point, right? And so he says, knowing the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ and then walking away and, and doing nothing? Who does that? And that's touching our sensibilities, isn't it? Ah, he knows me. <laughs> it's like he's writing this to me. <laughs> ah, yeah, well, uh, sometimes I do that. And he's saying, okay, no, no, no. Let's, let's do a reality check now. Let's remember the word of grace. Let's listen to the word and do it because they go together. Don't deceive yourself because true faith is never alone. Grace is never alone. It's actually accompanied by the fruit of the gospel in our personal living and following the Lord Jesus, becoming more like him. And if God so chooses, seeing that actually go out. So I've got two reflections for you by way of application. I have been, I'm responsible for organising foundations. And foundations is our course that's preparing people for baptism and confirmation. And it is full, because I've made it full, 
of being clear about Jesus. So people have to do a two-minute gospel summary and they have to even get down to a 20-word version so that they're super, super clear because it's even harder to express the gospel in 20 words than it is in 50 words than it is in 200 words. And we're looking through the whole of the Gospel of Mark and we're asking questions, who is Jesus? Why did he come? What does that mean for us? We're talking about personal testimony and the clarity of understanding Jesus in the middle of that. But I'm realising that I need to be asking everyone, not just what do you believe, but what are you doing? Write out for me what you've been doing this week. I need you to do a, a what, what's that thing called, a time, a time and motion survey and bring it next Sunday. And we're going to sit down and have a look at that thing. We're not going to do that, Foundations people, relax. But I think the course needs to be rejigged a bit in the light of James because it's not just a matter of being clear about who Jesus is. It's a matter of being clear about who Jesus is and living a life that's based on knowing and loving him. So let me give you a positive example of how I've experienced this because it's a really beautiful thing isn't it that James says and again I want to remind you it seems like he wants to whack you in in the head all the time but what he's saying is I'm going to challenge you but here are God's resources and I'm going to challenge you but here's how good it is and he says they will be blessed in what they do so there was a brother in Christ we got to know in Florence called Gaston he was from the Ivory Coast he was a religious and a political um, exile because of the, the situation in the Ivory Coast. And he fled pretty well with nothing. That meant that he was at the mercy of the generosity of anyone in Italy, and in particular, the members of our church and other churches in Florence. And so, as a response to the servant king who served me and the gracious God who has shown me grace, I and we as a family sought to be gracious to him. We would have him around for meals. I would catch up with him. And um, fairly semi-regularly, I would make sure that I'd, I'd give him five or ten euros every time we met, just so that he would have something in his pocket. I knew other people were probably helping him out as well, and I didn't want to give him too much, just so that he wouldn't think that I was his personal banker, or I credit the line of credit and keep coming back to me just for the money. In 2000, so we left Italy in 2015. I had the opportunity to go back in 2018 for the wedding of a guy who was an apprentice under me. And Gaston, as, as Gaston found out that I was going to be in Florence, but I didn't have much time, he was desperate that he would, he would see me. And so we had about half an hour in the train station just before I got on the train to go elsewhere. And he pulled out of his wallet because his circumstances had changed. He, he gave me a 50 euro note. And I knew what was going on in that moment <laughs> because what was happening was he was saying, I'm going to bless you because you've blessed me. It was awesome, actually. It was a fantastic demonstration of how when we are all serious about receiving God's grace and showing God's grace, we don't actually need to worry about ourselves. Because if I've got my eyes on Jesus and how he's loved me, I'll actually be trying to take care of you. And if you've got your eyes on Jesus and how he's taking care of you, you'll actually have your eyes on me. And when this is actually functioning... We are all just taking care of each other. It's so awesome. That is how we want to grow as a community, right? Because we say we want to be a people gripped by the love of God in Christ. And we want to, we want to be available to, to be serving others, to see strangers, to believers, to lovers, to warriors. That's what we want to be on about. So I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, life is not about performance. It's not about your bank account. It's not about the house or the number of houses you're going to have or the career that you're going to have. It's just not that at all. And that's what James is saying. Um, because all those, all those narratives will push you in a direction. Those things can sit under the Lordship of Christ and that's where they must sit. But you've got to make sure that you're listening to the word. You're humbly accepting the word and you're actually doing what the word says. And that's going to show itself in graciousness that's turned outwards. And, and an easy way of practicing that is actually after church. Um, and I just want to encourage you, if, if you're finding yourselves always talking to the same people... Can you start to look out for people you don't know and practice grace by being turned outwards? It's just a really, really easy way of getting on with what God's talking about here. So how can a person produce the righteousness that God desires? What does true religion look like? Well, James finishes off very practically in this, in this part of the, uh, the chapter. Bite your tongue. Open your heart. 
and be in the world, not of the world. Have a look at verses 25 to 26. Those who consider themselves religious and yet mm, do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. <clears throat> so true religion, um, scrupulously observing the rituals of faith. That's what true religion is. Doing what you say you believe. And James says, well, bite your tongue. He's already said it. I think he's just looping back around now and, and closing off this section. Be quick to listen to his word and not your own. Stop talking a good game. Check your own narrative. Are you making up your own rules? If you're anything like me, you absolutely are. I think I'm the expert on everything. And I'm pretty right most of the time. <laughs> so practical Christianity, actually genuine trust, means letting Jesus' word come more into your ears and more out of your mouth than your own words would come out of your mouth. And true religion shows itself out into a life of grace that keeps showing undeserved kindness to those who don't deserve it, the vulnerable and those who can't repay. And it's no accident that he would mention orphans and widows because in the historic context, these are people really, really at risk. Orphans um, at worst would just be abandoned and they would be left to die. Um, just a little bit back from worse would be taken up as, as free slaves to be used and abused by anyone who wanted to pick them up um, for the rest of their natural lives. Widows, uh, if their family don't take up the obligation to care for them and the community is not working the way that it should to care for them, they're extremely vulnerable to be abused and if they want to survive, to, to have to do who knows what. And so they represent categories of people who are absolutely in need potentially regarded as those who are absolutely undeserving, but the objects of Christian love. Why? Because God has loved his Jewish people that way. That's how he describes it in the Old Testament. I saw you by the side of the road. You still had the afterbirth on you. You were left to, to lie and die there. And I found you and I picked you up and I adopted you and I've cared for you. And in comes Jesus. And he's, he's used and abused. He loves the very people who kill him. And what are his people called to do? The very same thing. It's no surprise, is it? And finally, true religion goes out into the world, amongst the world, but it doesn't let the world get in to you. So that's the whole polluted idea. So instead, uh, we're going out actually to be the fragrance of Christ to those who need it and listening to the word, humbly accepting the word and doing the word so we actually live out the word instead of letting other people's words live their goals out in us. So who would be those people actually in, in your sphere who are the vulnerable? And there, there, there are those people at school. There are those people at university. There are those people at work... There are those people amongst us. And what we've got to keep asking ourselves is, okay, are we actually being compelled by the love of God in Christ and, and heading out towards other people? Or are we just kind of sitting around making a new kingdom for ourselves and gathering people who are happy about that? Because grace-based living serves the vulnerable. And here's how beautiful it is. It frees us from the tyranny of self-serving and that everything would be for me. And in my personal experience, what it actually does, it frees my mind and gives me purpose. Because I'm not thinking about myself, actually. I'm thinking about the Lord Jesus and his agenda for me and for the world, and I just want to get on with that. And it's just revolutionary. It's awesome. It's really good. It produces God's righteousness, God's Christ-likeness. So I started by remembering the Royal Commission, and I'm sorry I did. But those accounts and those testimonies just recount people saying one thing and doing the opposite. And in fact, what they've done is cursed other people and they've cursed themselves. And we're still feeling the effect. That's why Safe Ministry exists, actually. It's a direct outcome of what people in the recent past did not do. And where any one of them called themselves Christians, they were effectively non-practicing and they were Christian in name only. 
and they allowed the world in to pollute and poison them and this continued in poisoning others by their evil actions and James is just saying stop 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 in fact he's saying something much better than that come in come in come in come in come in experience the grace fully experience the blessing more and here's here's my challenge to you what would it mean just uh, this week to do one thing that kind of presses in to showing grace and experiencing the blessing? And maybe we can kind of talk about that together next week. That would be a great thing to do. But let's pray now and then we'll have time for questions. Father, thanks heaps for your grace to us in Christ that comes to us by faith, just by trusting him. Thank you, Lord, for your great kindness, giving good things to those who never, ever deserved it. And Father, thanks that we have your word. But please help us to listen to your word in Christ. Please help us to humbly welcome his word over us and let him rule over us and and help us to do grace, um, to show it. And we ask, Lord, that you bring us more fully into that joy and the blessing of being more like you and your son by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, why don't you take a moment just to to think about your questions. Maybe someone could run the mic around if that's okay. Go for it if you've got a question. So please please ask a question. Um, If you've got statements or comments to make, just come and tell me afterwards, that's cool. Um, But this is question time. Two fifteen is talking about when it says the requirements of the law were written on your heart. If it's the same thing, or it's like a different thing. Yes. Okay. So I think what he's talking about there—the word humbly, the word planted in you—I'm understanding that to be the gospel. Yep. And I'd probably see, I'd probably see a slight difference between that and Romans chapter two. Um, although, I think the conviction of the Spirit through the gospel. And actually, the Spirit generally convicting people of God's righteous law, there'd be a connection there. But yeah, I think, Sam, in, in James, he's actually talking about the gospel, yeah, which can save you. Yeah. Yep. In verse 26, it says, those who consider themselves religious. So was religious still a good thing, whereas now often we see... I'm not religious, I'm Christian. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a hard question, Dave. Uh, it's a good question. So, yes, I, I think he's having a ping at, 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 at an existing category then, for sure, you know, where, where there is some sense whether, it, whether it's Jewish um, or not. But I, I think particularly Jewish and maybe Jewish Christian, yeah, if they've, got, if they've got a certain mindset and a certain kind of way of doing things, but it's not reflected in, in the way that they're using their tongues, that's deeply problematic. So that maybe, you know, back in that context, um, yeah, I, I think it wouldn't be, like in, in today's kind of situation, wouldn't be wrong, would it, to think that um, people are going to probably consider this more in the light of people, those of us who consider ourselves to be Christians, and maybe we want to even think about that amongst ourselves, you know, because I think James is addressing a believing audience or an audience that says they're believers. So I think it'd be right to say, well, if you, if you consider yourself a Christian and so do I, are we keeping a tight rein on our tongues, you know, just as, as part of actually being true to what we believe, i.e. God's word is the word of truth and our word is not. And so how do we lock that down so that he can keep speaking over us? Yeah. There's a hand lurking in the back. The usual suspects. We need to encourage other... This is why I'm saying think about your life group uh, material and questions and bring them along to break the nexus of... uh, I've always got questions, Andrew. Um, Another Andrew. Um, Yeah, with the scope, uh, Scripture observation, application, prayer, I think it's fantastic. 
Uh, however, it takes me more than a couple of days sometimes, or maybe I'm even three, before I get to a point of, ah, I'm not sure that might mean the rest of my life, but I'm ready for Exodus at the moment. And yep. And why. So it might take a few days before I get to ob- uh, application and prayer. Is that the case with yourself, or do you find something every day? It's good, isn't it, because each of us has different sensibilities and the way that we like to to read the scriptures, you know, going long and being exhaustive uh, and others of us, maybe we're right on the other end of that spectrum. We don't have much of a, a, of a habit at all. So I think what I'm trying to get into the groove of doing is having a regular pattern of sitting down, doing the Bible reading using soap and working out how it's going to work. So I'm not freaking out at the moment that I don't get to the fullness of what I think I should get to or, or if I've just been too quick at it. Because what I'm really glad about is that um, I'm in the Word each day and I'm working on, working on an approach that I think is a good approach. It's a helpful approach for unlocking the passage. So the thing that I'm, like I said before, the, I think I said it before, the thing that I'm really enjoying is writing the prayer. Because even if I don't feel like I've kind of super completely understood the passage, I'll go to my key verse and I'll write a key, I, I will write a prayer that's kind of working off the back of the key verse in any application I've seen. Um, because my plan is that maybe in three, six, nine months' time, I'll kind of check in with how I think it's going rather than worry this week that I've nailed it. Yeah, that's kind of how I'm feeling about it. But you'll, you, you know, I know you have your own sensibilities, I've got mine. But I think what I want to encourage everyone is give it a crack. Um, because uh, one of the corroborating pieces of evidence that we that we heard recently at an MTS kind of training day was that a church in Western Sydney um, 15 years ago kind of started to realise that their people weren't really reading the Bible, they'd been assuming that they were. And I think what they found was 10% of people are reading the Bible every day, 20% of the people are reading the Bible once a week and the other 80% are probably not reading the Bible much at all. And um, we just want to we just want to work to a point where more of us are reading more regularly hearing the hearing from the lord and growing that habit um over time and uh, yeah i think that's a long-range goal so i just want to encourage each of you keep working at it um and we want to check in in a year's time right at the vision celebration service next year maybe one more question is there one more question on james thanks andrew i just spoke about looking for uh, the vulnerable and particularly as them uh, being objects of Christian love. I wondered if you had a word for people who feel um, more in that space than as people who are, have the capacity to be looking out for others, if that yep. makes sense. Yep. That's good. That's a really helpful question. So I think for people who at the moment are not feeling like they've got the capacity or the energy or the understanding, uh, call it what you will, to be, be the outward turning people, I think it would be, I think it'd be a really good thing just to be receiving the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first thing I, that w- I would say. Because even though James is pushing uh, living, he does, I, I don't think he's working away from a basis of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. And that's why I guess I wanted to make a bit of a deal of chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 3 and 6, chapter 1, verse 18. Because as we put that back together and also, also we understand James back in his context of the Gospels and of Acts, he's a, he's, a, he's a grace guy. And so a word to you if you really are, are struggling and absolutely there are people amongst us who are and that's, that, that is life. Um, the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ is upon you and receive it. Uh, no freaking out. And what you can get to each day, get to. You know, even can you pray one prayer, pray one prayer and just thank God for his grace in Christ. Can you um, just take a little bit of a, a dab at soap, have a go at that and pray for the rest of us that we will actually love you. Um, because, and so here, here's the thing and maybe I'll just finish with this. It's a great difficulty for many of us, and I think blokes in particular, to receive the love of other people and actually let, let each other know that we need it. And it's a chronic situation, right? So mental health, it, it's a recipe of mental health disaster. 
and more men committing suicide each year than women. That's, that's absolutely a genuine statistic. We heard that this year just in the course of the push-up challenge. Um, so can we actually grow the mentality that it is, it is, it's okay to receive and let other people know that we need it? Because I think without that humility, we're just never going to be able to get the community happening the way that God wants it to happen. Um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's okay to feel not okay. God's grace is for you. Um, do let others know. Because what we're trying to grow up actually in, it, and I'll, I'll, it's not a plug for Serve 2023, but it's a good way of explaining why we're doing what we're doing. We're trying to grow our discipleship in community and we're trying to grow our care for each other in that context. Um, because it's too easy for us to be isolated from each other, just turn up to a church service occasionally, not really be known, and then really be going badly. But what we're trying to grow is a majority participation in church and life group with a genuine Christ-centeredness that cares for each other. And so I can't encourage you more strongly, actually, to be in a life group, um, because that, that is partly why they exist, yeah. So thanks for that question, Anna. Also, if you are feeling like... Um, you are not at that point where you can give and you need to let someone know, I'd be glad to hear it. Ian would be glad to hear it. Um, I'm sure Anna would be glad to hear it as the question asker. Um, but please let's talk with each other and pray. You know, like we can easily do that after church each week. Um, I'll just let's do that and be, be here for each other. That's partly why we turn up, I think, not only just to listen, but actually to grow in our doing. And like I said before, if you just find yourself with the same people every Sunday... I just want to challenge that. Um, that's not pushing out with grace, and it's a really safe place to do that here. It gets harder the further out you go, so let's practice that amongst ourselves. Let me pray, and then I'll hand over to the musos. Thanks, guys. Yeah, let's pray. Father, thanks that you come to us in our utter weakness, and when we remember the imagery of what Israel was like by the side of the road absolutely about to take its last breath without any hope in the world and then in you came and so we pray for ourselves tonight lord have mercy on us we ask you especially for those amongst us lord god who are feeling absolutely wrung out and right on the edge and we do ask father that you would keep hanging on to them and they would receive your grace and uh, that not only would they might make a courageous step of making known that they need help but the rest of us um, would actually be ready to help and responding to Christ as we do. We pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.